Hi everybody and welcome to Love Fraud Live. Here's why sociopaths succeed. No matter what they actually do and say, these men and women have style and it turns out that's all they need. I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com and tonight I'll explain a classic scientific experiment that proves how far people can go just on style. At the end of my presentation, I'll answer your questions. To join the chat or ask a question, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. So sociopaths are typically described as charismatic, glib, grandiose, magnetic, and energetic. In other words, they've got style. According to a classic experiment in education research, style is all that is needed to be respected and believed. Back in 1970, psychiatrists at the University of Southern California conducted an experiment. They hypothesized that student ratings of educators depended largely on personality variables and not educational contact. They wanted to test their theory. The experiment was ingenious. The results go a long way towards explaining why sociopaths get away with portraying themselves as experts on topics about which they know absolutely nothing. I know this happens because I watched my disordered ex-husband do it on multiple occasions. This was the experiment. 11 psychiatrists, psychologists, and social worker educators who were attending an educational conference were invited to a lecture on mathematical game theory as applied to physician education. The speaker was Dr. Myron L. Fox, who was introduced as an accomplished the expert on game theory. In reality, this Dr. Fox was an actor. He was hired to play the part of an expert and he knew nothing at all about game theory. Even worse, the researchers coached the actor to talk in circles, use double talk, and contradict himself. They also told him to use parenthetical humor and to make meaningless references to unrelated topics. That's exactly what the actor did. You can watch his presentation on YouTube. There's a link in the window below this video. So here's what he said at the beginning of his talk. It was not long before they realized that game theory was not primarily concerned with disclosing the optimum strategy, what it really is concentrating on is concerned with the logic of conflict, that is, with the theory of strategy. Sounds good, right? <laughs> well, in reality, Dr. Fox said absolutely nothing. The actor kept it up for an hour and then took questions for a half an hour. Throughout his entire presentation, he didn't say anything that made sense. No one in the audience of professional educators even noticed. They did not figure out that the lecture was a sham. In fact, they loved him. Their evaluations after the presentation were overwhelmingly positive. It gets worse. Dr. Fox's presentation was videotaped and shown to two more groups. The second group was 11 more psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychiatric social workers. The third group comprised 33 educators and administrators enrolled in a graduate level educational philosophy course. The results, when the two later groups filled out their evaluations, they too were overwhelmingly positive about Dr. Fox. Nobody detected the fraud. 
The authors of this study described the results as educational seduction. They wrote that people could be effectively seduced into an illusion of having learned if the lecturer simulates a style of authority and wit. When a student's perception of learning is significantly affected by the instructor's presentation style and not the content of the lecture, it's now called the Dr. Fox effect. And it gets worse. This study was repeatedly replicated. That means researchers conducted similar experiments and the results were exactly the same. A recent version of this research concluded that students were aware that they didn't actually learn anything, even though they continued to rate the speaker highly. Now, to me, the more important point is that people, including professional mental health educators, are likely to regard a person and his or her message positively based solely on style. Someone who speaks with authority, energy, and warmth will be respected and believed, even if the content of their communication is total nonsense. Unfortunately, the human tendency to respond to style over substance plays right into the hands of sociopaths. All they have to do is speak with confidence and turn on the charm, and we believe them. It's a human failing that makes us all susceptible to deception and manipulation. And I believe this is a big reason why sociopaths succeed. That's the presentation for tonight. Next, I'll answer your questions. If you want an in-depth advice about your own situation, I do offer personal consultations and a new service for deep emotional release in which I help you to process the wounds of your experience. There's a link in the description below this video. Okay. Oh, so Gerard says, as a school principal, I worked, a school principal I worked for was handsome, wore expensive suits and had styled hair and shiny shoes. Yet he had no university degree and behind the scenes was vicious. Parents loved him and teachers hated him. Yeah, you know, it's just amazing how the appearance and the charm and the um, persona that somebody can put forward j just can be so dominant. In fact, um, I mentioned in the presentation that I saw, I actually saw my husband do this and, and I can think of a, a couple of examples of that. Um, my ex-husband was from Australia. His, his background was um, an advertising agency. He, he did have a job at one point, like long before I met him. Then of course he claimed to be a Hollywood script writer. But here in Atlantic City, where we lived, um, at the time, I was doing a lot of business with the casinos. I, I, did, I wrote three casino newsletters. And um, he was floundering around, you know, trying to figure out what, um, how he was going to make money, what his next big get-rich-quick scheme was going to be. So I hooked him up with an interview with a guy who I did business with, who was the head of the slot department at one of the casinos. And so my ex-husband um, spent about mm, half an hour, maybe an hour online, and then announced to me that I understand, I understand the slot business. And I'm like, yeah, you, you've been looking online for like an hour. How can you possibly say that you understand the slot business? You know, there, there's a lot to it. No, 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 I understand it. So he had his meeting and nothing came of it. And I guess the guy quickly figured out that my husband knew nothing about the slot business. But that was just so typical. I, I, I saw him do it on so many occasions where, you know, in fact, he actually said to me once, 
he had a, a pet hedgehog when I met him, this little little creature. He was, was kind of cute. He had these little prickly quills sticking out. And he, the hedgehog's name was Herbie. And he said to me, between me and Herbie, we know just about everything. And I was like, oh, my God. But that was just so typical of how he was. All right, so Jennifer says, when I met my sociopath husband, he didn't dress well on our first date, but I did. So on our second date, he dressed up much nicer. I guess he was mirroring me. Um, yeah, that could very well be what happened. Uh, he figured out what you were looking for, or at least how you presented yourself, and then uh, went and did the same thing. So he was trying to learn from you what you were looking for. And, and that's, of course, that's something that, I've heard so much about in a lot of um, the research that I've done. In fact, one of the um, red flags that I discuss in my book, Red Flags of Love Fraud, 10 Signs You're Dating a Sociopath, is the sudden soulmate. And what that means is that when you meet a sociopath, uh, you, you feel like you've met your soulmate. You feel like this person is just like you and exactly what you want and there's a reason for that and the reason is that the sociopath studies you figures out what you're looking for and then makes himself or herself exactly into that person and you know they they do it all the time and and I've had plenty of people say to me that you know he just he just mirrored me everything that I liked he liked her and everything that I wanted she wanted and it's, it's just a very common tactic that they use. <laughs> so, uh, Moy's making a joke here. He triangulated you against the hedgehog. <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, the hedgehog was actually pretty cute. I, I kind of liked him. And um, he, my ex-husband brought multiple exotic pets into the house. Um, when I left him, I kept the pets because I, I didn't want them to have to... I, I knew he wouldn't take care of them because he didn't when, when we were here. I mean, I was the one who took care of the animals. But anyway, he continued to assume that he could do anything and that and anything that came along, he would have the answer to. And, and he, he was just amazing as far as how he would do that. In fact... Of course, the, the biggest of this was that um, when I first started corresponding with my ex-husband, he told me that he was a Vietnam um, veteran and had served several tours in Vietnam uh, with the Australian military. I mean, at the time, I didn't even know Australians were in Vietnam, but they were. That, that part was true. And... He told me that he won the Victoria Cross, which is the highest military honor in Australia, equivalent to our Congressional Medal of Honor in the United States. Um, he told me he won this honor for his heroism, and he sent me what they call mention in dispatches, which is like a report that some other person wrote um, about his heroism. And he, it's this whole story about how you know they, they came under fire and and Captain Montgomery single-handedly cleared all the enemy and all, all this other kind of stuff. And he, he sent me the document. And when he was here, he um, joined the Vietnam Veterans Association. He actually did presentations for Veterans Day, was the keynote speaker at a Veterans Day ceremony, talked to school kids about being in the military. The guy was never in the military. He, he like read books and talked to people and watched movies and made the whole thing up. And it, it was just unbelievable that he did that. <clears throat> oh, this is great. Shauna says, when I meet men now and they ask what I want in a man, I now say, just be yourself. I'm not giving them a script to act out anymore. Shauna, that is brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant, and um, I commend you for for coming up with that because it's 
it's just fabulous. And I'll have to remember that and offer that when people ask me, you know, what do you do? And, and say, yeah, tell them to be yourself. That, that's great because then you get to see what they're, what they're, what they're actually like. Uh, J-Lo, wow. I assume that's not our famous J-Lo, but cool. Um, love your videos. They have helped me so much. I'm so glad. Um, I'm, I'm glad the videos are, are helpful, and that's why I do them, you know, hoping to help people understand what they're dealing with in these situations. So Nancy Levin asks, do you think they believe the lies? Um, actually, I think that they know they are lying and, and that's the thing about people who have antisocial or psychopathic or narcissistic personality disorder they are not psychotic okay when someone's psychotic that means that they're delusional they're hearing voices you know they're they're not connected to reality and that is absolutely not the case with people who have these personality disorders, with psychopaths, antisocials, or narcissists. They are not delusional. They are not crazy. They know exactly what they're doing. They know the difference between right and wrong. They just don't care about the difference between right and wrong and feel entitled to do whatever they want. So they know that they're lying i'm sure my ex-husband knew that he was never in the military and, I, and i'm sure he knew that he was never in vietnam and they just feel so entitled to whatever it is that they want that they feel entitled to lie and tell whatever stories and make up whatever and from their point of view if the rest of us are dumb enough to believe them that's our problem not theirs so they do not necessarily believe their lies, but they do believe that they are entitled to lie. So that's the difference with that one. Okay, so Christine asks, can sociopathic behavior be diagnosed from very, very early in a child? Um, in some cases, yes. In fact, there's a, a whole group of researchers, the psychopathy researchers, who are concentrating on the early signs of disorder in children. And what they've found is that they call it callous and unemotional, that the young children who don't seem to have this need they, they often tend to be very independent they don't necessarily want to be around their mothers or their fathers but primarily their mothers um, they don't seem to have any need for connection um, things happen and you know they they don't really have a response um, you know all these types of traits callous unemotional is what it's called um, they're early warning signs that a, a child may be at risk for developing a personality disorder. Um, I've heard of people who've told me that, you know, unfortunately they had children with someone who was disordered. And as, you know, they watch these kids growing up and, you know, some of them are, are lying and uh, from an early age and um, you know, are cruel at an early age. So, um, that's what you want to look for. The, the, the terminology is callous and unemotional. Uh, there, there's research on it. Um, a little bit older, they can be diagnosed with conduct disorder or oppositional defiance disorder. That's essentially the children version of um, antisocial personality disorder. Um, we do have a webinar um, presented by my colleague, Dr. Liedman, on helping children overcome the genetic predisposition. So if, you, if you're in that situation, you might want to check it out. Um, it's, it's designed primarily for a therapist, but you can follow the story of, of what's going on. And um, the last segment of it does offer some advice for how to work with kids um, who, who might be at risk. Okay, so 
Mom with phone says, since figuring out that my mother is a sociopath, I have realized that giving birth does not automatically cause a woman to be nurturing. And that's absolutely true. In fact, um, I've done some research, maybe one of these days I'll get around to writing that up, specifically with female sociopaths. And I mean, these stories are unbelievable. They're, they're, they're just horror shows of, of how cruel um, women can be to their children. In fact, my most recent book on senior sociopaths, it has a chapter on um, sociopaths as parents. And that's exactly what I talk about. I, I have all the research as far as what these parents were like, both with minor children and when their children became adults. And essentially, you know, they were brutal all through and uh, exploitative and certainly not caring, certainly not concerned about their children's welfare. And the sad things is that that's how they start out and it never gets any better. So um, if you're looking for some more explanation, you, you might want to check out my new book on senior sociopaths. So Colleen says, I agree with you. They know they have a problem. My ex malignant narcissist admitted to me, I don't feel unless you do. And my problems run too deep. So, yep. They may not always know their diagnosis, but they often do know that they're different. And the scary thing is that in many cases, they're proud of themselves. I mean, from their point of view, they don't have those stupid emotions or a pesky conscience to get in the way of doing what they want to do. And they consider that to be a competitive advantage. So it's, it's pretty scary. I mean, the, the bottom line is they, you know, they really don't know what they're missing. So they feel perfectly fine with abusing people emotionally because it doesn't bother them. Oh, Colleen says, love the senior sociopath book. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy with that one. It, it, um, it's a lot, it's packed with information and, and I was really pleased to, to, um, put it out there. So the point of the senior sociopath book is that if these people are disordered, they do not change. They do not get better. In fact, there's a very good chance that their behavior and their treatment of you will get worse. So there's no point waiting around hoping that someone with antisocial or psychopathic or narcissistic personality disorder is going to become normal because it, it's not going to happen. I mean, they might be able to tone it down a little bit. Like those who have committed crimes may decide that they don't want to go to jail anymore, but they're still going to be playing games. So yeah, they're just, they just, it's, it's too late. They're, they're just not going to get better. So, oh, so Jennifer says she's reading Recovery from the Sociopath. She likes it. Great. Thank you very much. So, okay. That looks like all the questions that we have for today. Thank you everybody for joining me and we'll see you next week for the next episode of Love Fraud Live. Good night, everybody.